Thank you, brother. Yeah, you can just put it in that holder. Um, I want to give an update really quick. Uh, three weeks ago, we launched Build Gentian 100, which if you haven't listened to that sermon, I'd really encourage you to. It's a sermon that really tells about who we're aspiring to be as a church. Um, the Gentian 100, we're referring to the year 100 of our church, uh, which is about three and a half years away, and who we aspire to become. Um, I set in front of us the vision that our staff has worked through and where we are aiming towards, which is becoming a church that plants churches um, and that helps others to do so. Because we recognize that the Great Commission, going and making disciples of all nations, is not accomplished. And we recognize that that's not even accomplished in our own city, in different groups and peoples who are uh, coming here in this city that is uh, not just one group of people, but it's a uh, uh, multi-groups coming together to live in this area. And so um, we launched that, and we recognize there's three goals that we've got to uh, accomplish to help us get to the place of being healthy. This is building that church. It's not just going to happen by osmosis and just uh, letting it happen. We have to work towards this goal. One was discipleship, and we gave the goal of every member of our church being involved in some kind of discipleship group on a regular basis, um, whether that's Sunday school, whether that's a home Bible study, whether it's um, some the growth classes that we do on Sunday nights. And I just wanted to give you some updates on kind of where we are as a church in these goals. Uh, with our members, we have 201 local members. That's members who are here in the city that it's reasonable for us to expect to be able to help us meet these goals. Uh, out of the 201 local members, we have 116 people who are actively in this, so about 58%. It's a good starting point. Uh, for the stewardship goal, we recognize that we've got to build financial stability in our church and build the point of being able to even have excess to be able to help send and uh, help outside of our church more than we even currently are. So we set the goal of $5,000 of new reoccurring monthly donations to the church. We are at about 57% of that goal at 2,865 new recurring donations. So I want to encourage you to consider that still. And then for partnership, we, reckon we set the goal of every one of our members serving in some capacity, whether inside or outside of the church. Because um, we believe that that's one of the ways that God really shapes us and helps us to be able to meet our community is by partnering, not just in the church, but outside of the church. And so we've gone through, and to the best of our knowledge, out of the 201 local members, uh, 83 are serving in some capacity either inside or outside the church, or about 41%. So these are all goals that we're making significant progress on, and I think we should be encouraged by where we're starting at and aspire to be uh, further along, uh, not be discouraged in any way. Uh, I just wanted to give you that update, and you can see these uh, goals and stuff will start to keep uh, things out that help us keep track of how we're progressing in these goals. The second thing is next week we have Mother's Day, and I think Sage announced it. Uh, it's going to be a unique service because what we're doing, uh, one, you may be able to look at me and figure this out. I am not a mother, um, <laughs> and so what we're going to do next week is we're going to have, um, I'm going to give a short sermon at the beginning of our time, and then we are actually going to have four mothers come up and have a panel where I'm going to ask them questions about how their faith and how their belief in God impacted them as mothers and as spouses and just have that conversation with them, um, which I think will be incredibly encouraging and beneficial to us as a church. Um, they can give a lot more practical advice than I can. And so, um, and then third thing, you may have noticed this really nice bouquet of flowers. Uh, this comes from Tim Jones to honor his mom and dad, Mr. Odell and Ms. Carol Ann's 60th wedding anniversary that's coming up. And so, I don't know if y'all knew these are for y'all or not. But these are your flowers, and uh, there's 60 roses in it uh, to honor you guys. And so congratulations on that. Y'all are a precious couple. Y'all have been faithful to this church, and y'all have been faithful to one another. And I'm really grateful for you guys. And um, I'll also use Tim Jones, uh, something he said this morning, to start us off talking about this story of Lazarus. Because he told me when he was in seminary, 
one of the greatest students that he was in seminary with, they had to prepare a, uh, a, uh, a funeral outline. And that student went into the passage that we just read, where Jesus recognizes that he is, uh, Lazarus has died, and he plucked, talk about taking something out of context, plucked this verse out and said, this is what I'm going to base it on. Um, Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus has died. I'm glad. And stop there. <laughs> I said, that is definitely a little bit more context that helps us understand that. Like, I am glad for you that I wasn't there so you may believe. Like, finish the sentence. But nonetheless, uh, if I ever preach your funeral, uh, <laughs> I will not use that one sentence, but I very well will likely read from this passage. Um, I've preached several funerals, and this is where I usually wind up going. I don't know a, a passage that's more comforting than a passage that reaches into the very heart of what's happening at a time of someone's funeral, which is grief and sorrow of a loss. Uh, it's often a moment where our highest beliefs and greatest comforts in who God is comes crashing into some of the starkest and darkest realities of this world that we live in when we lose someone that we really love and care for especially if it's ahead of their time, unexpected, tragic in some sort of way. It just seems to compound the grief that you feel in that moment. As I sit with families and talk with them and try to minister, there's no one-size-fits-all way of going about it. I mean, when you walk into that, uh, in the sermon this morning, I called it a meeting in grief. When you walk into those meetings, when you step into that grief, uh, there's a real sense of helplessness. Like, how do I comfort? How do I, what am I supposed to do in this moment? Um, You know, it feels like you're flying by the seat of your pants, no matter how much you prepare for it, no matter how much you have done it. Um, Pastors that I've read and who have talked to me about it say that it often only gets harder the more that you have to do it, not easier. Because walking into those meetings where you are walking into a situation where someone's grieving, We've all seen it. It's not scripted. There's no simple formula for how to go through it. And as we read this passage, even, uh, there's some ways that it can be kind of perplexing. Like, the first thing I just want to point out is that in grief, often there are more questions than answers. You, You Take this first passage. Now, a man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, a village from Mary and her sister Martha. Now I want you to listen to this in a way that's not like rosy colored goggles with Jesus. Like, imagine you're in this moment with him. You are walking with him. And you are hearing what these men are hearing. And Jesus is responding the way he's responding and how you would feel in this moment. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. We're going to be told about that in chapter 13. And it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sister sent a message to him, Lord, the one you love is sick. And when Jesus heard it, he said, This sickness will not end in death, but it's for his glory, the glory of God, and so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. It kind of seems like a platitude to me. Like, oh, he's sick. And Jesus is like, well, it's for God's glory, Um, which is true. But when you're sitting with people who are grieving, that's usually one of the most unimpactful things that I know that we know it's true. But I mean, I'm sure that you've seen it. You have someone who's grieving. And if you say this is for God's glory, it's not comforting. Uh, No matter how well intentioned or how true it is. So it's a little bit perplexing to me, like, okay, this is going to be for God's glory. Now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. Okay, he loves them. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Like, that's perplexing to me. Why does he stay? Why doesn't he go? It says he loved them, so he did not go to comfort them. Then after that, his disciples said, 
he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. Now, uh, the place that they are in um, is in Judea. Bethany's in Judea. So he's going to that area, but his disciples say, Rabbi, just now the Jews tried to stone you, and you're going there again. Okay, so maybe that's some of the reason why he stayed in the place that he was at, but then, but then he's still deciding to go. Like, there's a threat of persecution. There's a threat of him being stoned again if he goes back into this area. And then Jesus says this, Aren't there 12 hours in a day? If anyone walks during the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks during the night, he does stumble because the light is not in him. Like, this is, okay, Lazarus is sick, Jesus, and we're saying that they're trying to stone you, and you're telling us about light and darkness. And then, if Jesus is, feeling convicted that he needs to be more clear, he ignores that, obviously, when he then says, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going to go wake him up. And they're like, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, like, he's going to get well. Like, you know, what do doctors usually tell you? Like, rest and water, like, to get you through a sickness. Like, if he's going to sleep, Jesus, like, you showing up to wake him up, like, let him rest. Why are you wanting to go wake him up? And then Jesus, finally speaking clearly to them, says, Lazarus has died. I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may believe, but let's go to him. And then you kind of see this response, this wave hit them when they realize what's really occurring. Then Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too so that we may die with him. Like, nothing about this encounter should feel like normal. I don't think it's intended to. Uh, I, nothing about this seems like the appropriate responses. Nothing seems uh, clear cut. Like if we're writing a script for your friend is sick, how do you care for them and minister well to them? I would not use Jesus in this passage as a basis for that like plan. Like I would, I would say you go to him. You go to the family. You seek to comfort them. You spend time with them. You, you do those sorts of things. You don't, you don't delay for seemingly no reason and then go and kind of give these platitudes and things that are confusing where there's not really answers and you know his disciples aren't getting it and then Jesus is speaking finally at the end very clearly and you see the impact it hits where it strikes them to the heart and they're like, let's go that we may die with him. Like they're grieved over this. I, I read this and I'm just, I'm perplexed, but I'm also, it's not unfamiliar to me. Because how many times is it that when we have this encounter where there is someone that who has been lost, who's passed away, who's died, that you're going to them and you look at why and questions about like, how is this happening and what kind of plan is behind this and What's the thought and intention that God's bringing to bear on this? And when you're sitting in that moment, you have no answers to a lot of the questions that are coming up. Uh, Why were they taken so young? Why did it happen at this point? What about these people that are reliant upon them? What are we going to do in all of these situations? Why did God let this happen? Like we wrestle through all these questions and we're grappling with it and we're grieving, but then on top of the grief, you've got all of these unknowns and these confusing things where it's like, don't you just wish that God would like clearly send down a script where he speaks as plainly as he does at the end? Instead of kind of these platitudes and it's for God's glory and all of these things, that you had something clear. Like, I called them home to me at this point in time because of blank. But it's often not that. It's unknown. It's questions. It's grief. It's people saying, I just wish that I could die with them. Uh, You have moments like this, this meeting, where Jesus, in a way that is just so typical of how it feels when you're going through grief with a family, Jesus playing the role of God and knowing seemingly what is about to occur and what's about to happen, knowing the plan that he has to accomplish, does it make it clear to those around him what the plan really is going to be? 
it, are we going to go or are we not going to go? Well, it's we're not going to go and then we are going to go. It, is, it, is he asleep or is he dead? And Jesus in this whole thing seems to not feel the necessity to really bring clarity. Man. You know, he speaks in platitudes. He speaks in these kind of, these really symbolic imagery like, uh, you know, while you have the light for the 12 hours, you walk in the light and the ones who see it walk in the light and they don't stumble. And I just, as I was preparing this week, the sense that I just got from this is just with the disciples, how would the disciples have felt in this moment? And I think it's often how you and I feel in those moments. Like, we, yes, I believe in you, Jesus. And I've given up so much to follow you. But right now, I don't really understand what you're doing in this moment. Like, you're doing all these things that seem just other they, they seem like they're not actually designed to help in this moment. Like, it's not the best thing to occur. Like, why are we doing this, Jesus? Why are we not going? But then you decide to go, why are we going now? Like, and I think we can, when we go through those moments of grief, feel the very same thing. Uh, one of the comforts that I often get from the Bible is not that the Bible gives us all the answers, but that sometimes the Bible just recognizes there are a lot more questions than we have answers to sometimes. And you read the story of Job. Take it as an example. Job, a man who loses his family, who loses all of his property, who loses his livestock, a man who loses his very health. He's sitting and just grieving and that whole book, dozens of chapters, and you get to the end, and what's the answer that God gives him? I don't owe you an answer. I'm God. Like, that is, I know as, it's like a Christian, trusting God, trusting Jesus. That's a satisfying answer in some ways. As a human, when I'm grieving, it's often not. But it's this interesting thing because the, the Bible, which is written to us, which does not run away from questions of grief and loss and why God. In fact, it's filled with people who ask those questions. It gets to the end and Jesus gives us the technically correct answer. This is for the glory of God and for his son. But the answers don't come. And I know that when I'm walking with families, there are times that you have people who are asking those questions and it starts to break their relationship with God and drive wedges between them. And sometimes you and I feel the pressure like we have to give them the answers. And so it can force you and I into situations where we may do things like try to, uh, God is limited in some way. You know, there, we can start to try to paint him in this uh, picture that we're compromising. He's not really totally in control of all things. Like, the thing that's hurting you right now is something that's out of his control in some way. But then we read the book of Job, and we get it very clearly stated where Job says, The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. And then he follows it up with one of the most perplexing statements that, Really, I hope that I can be the type of person that aspires to be able to say in my moments of grief and loss where he says the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. This is a man who is grieving the loss of his children, all of them. In one instant, children wiped out. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Like, this is a man who throughout the book asks questions and says, why God? And says, what are you doing? And he's over and over just grieving and mourning, and he's in this moment, he's processing it with God. And when it gets to the end of the book, it seems like the lesson that was taught to us was not, hey, God will give you all of the answers to help you understand everything he's doing. It was, the whole point was Job kept talking to God. Job kept going to him and saying, why God? And pleading with him and saying, if, if you'd only answer me, God, help me to understand. 
And then when his friends show up and they start saying things that are untrue about God, you know what Job does? He defends God. And he says these are not true what you are saying about him. God isn't someone that just punishes the wicked and prospers the righteous. Sometimes it's the righteous who suffer. And God's the one who both gives and he takes away. But he is still my God and I will bless his name. You and I as a church, when we are helping people through grief, it is not our responsibility to give answers that God himself does not give. And I think that what Jesus shows us in this is actually a much better way for helping people grieve. That's not, here's the right answers, move on. Grief, and the second point, there's no one way of dealing with it. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, in their custom, uh, when someone died, they weren't officially considered dead until the third day. And what they would do is they would go to the tomb on the third day, they would roll back the tomb, and then they would yell out into the tomb, Lazarus! Lazarus! Twice. And if Lazarus came out, he was alive. But if Lazarus did not rise up and walk out of the grave, he was officially declared dead. They would roll the tomb back and seal it. It might make more sense with like Mary going down to the tomb on the third day. It says they get there, the door is already rolled away. They're probably going down there to do something similar. And it also is significant that it comes on the fourth day because he is officially declared dead. Now, the reason why they would do this is because there were instances, they didn't understand comas like we do. So there were instances throughout history, well documented, of people being buried alive where people thought they were dead. That's why I used to, uh, you'll find in some cemeteries, they used to have a string that would run down into the coffin with a little bell that if the person woke up, they could ring it. Uh, So that would be a horrifying sound to hear. Uh, but you have different things like this through different cultures where they recognize sometimes people would go into the grave for days and then walk out of the grave. But in Jewish culture, they also said at day four, they're dead, officially dead. After we yelled out into the grave and we rolled the stone back on the third day, they are officially like, this is the death certificate, so to say. So Jesus shows up on the fourth day. Bethany was near Jerusalem, less than two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them about their brother. Uh, And these comforting, this time of mourning and grief would be sometimes, depending on who the person is, you could go for like 40 days of grieving with the family. Uh, The house was typically considered unclean because it had a dead body in it leading up to this. So the the people would come and bring meals Because they could cook them at their homes, they would be considered clean meals to eat, and they would bring it to the family for the family to be able to eat during that time of mourning. So much very similar to what we'll do, where you're bringing meals and food to just try to be there for the family, to sit with them, to grieve. And so as soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Notice, two very different responses already. And then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Yet even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Your brother will rise again, Jesus told her. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection and at the last day. And Jesus said to him, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she said. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God who comes into the world. And having said this, she went back and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And as soon as Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still at the place where Mary, or Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, got, saw that Mary got up and quickly went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to cry there. That was a, an appropriate response, is that uh, those closest would go to the tomb and would often wail. Um, It was such a, their culture also at that time, it wasn't just those closest, they would hire professional wailers to come in and wail at the grave with them and mourn the loss of this person. 
So they think that she's getting up to go to the tomb to just be totally overcome with emotion and just weeping and wailing, crying out. So they're following her. But instead, she goes to Jesus, and as soon as she came to Jesus and saw him, she fell at his feet and told him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you put him, he asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. Jesus wept. I want us to notice two very different ways that Jesus responds to two very different grievers. Uh, One of the greatest mistakes I think that we can often make when someone loses a, a loved one is to think that there is like a prescribed way that they need to grieve. Like, you have to do these things. And if you do these things, they are out of line. Uh-huh. You know, if you, if you grieve for this long, it's not long enough. If you grieve for this long, it's too long. We can start to have where we're like, I know what I went through when I lost this person, and what you're doing is not appropriate. And we can try and make it like, you have to do things in a certain way. But what Jesus models for us in this moment is he met the women who were grieving where they were in the grieving. Notice with Martha, she comes to him asking theological questions. She's like, you know, I know that whatever you ask, God will give you. Like if you had, if you had been here and just feel the weight of this question, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Like that's the same question that we often feel. God, if you really are who I believe you are, you wouldn't have let my loved one die. You wouldn't have taken them from me at this time. How could you do that? It doesn't make sense to me, God. Like, I know that you being all powerful, all good, all loving, if you, who can make people rise from the dead, can speak and creations come into existence, you could have kept my loved one from dying. And this is the exact same question that they ask. It hasn't changed in 2,000 years. Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. I've seen you heal, and I know that you could have healed him. It's not just if he had been there. We know from the centurion earlier on in John, if you just speak, they can be made well. Why can't you do it? Why didn't you do it? It, My understanding of who you're supposed to be is a, a God of healing and of mending and life. Why is it that you let my loved one die? But whatever you ask, God will give you. She starts asking these questions. And Jesus tells her, your brother will rise again. And then she, seemingly like a theologian, says, I know that he will rise again at the resurrection in the last day. Starts talking about what God will do at the end of time. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone, do you believe in this? Yes, you are the Messiah, the Son of God who comes into the world. And then she goes away. Notice how he meets her. She is coming to him with questioning. With wanting to try to understand things, trying to ask questions of him. And he meets her in that questioning. And he does try to give her answers that we do have. That is the thing. We don't have to have no answers when we're trying to bring people comfort and grief. We just don't have to try to answer questions that God alone knows the answers to. We give the answers that we do know, where he says there is a resurrection coming, and for those who believe in me, there will be life. It's why you and I can do as what Paul says and say that we grieve, but not as those without hope. And I think Martha exemplifies this, someone who is grieving, and Jesus is reminding her of the hope that she has. I think this is a good example for us of like how to appropriately handle those conversations. But notice Mary. There's no conversation that happens. She comes to him and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And it says, Jesus, seeing her crying and the Jews who were with her crying, He was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you put him? And he wept. Weep with those who weep. Mourn with those who mourn. There's an appropriate time. Uh, As Christians, we, we get grieved, but not as those without hope. I think it's also appropriate to say hope 
but also grieve with those who grieve. You, you can't take the hope of Jesus and the resurrection and just pretend like that person is not all of a sudden suffering a tremendous loss because of death and its presence in the world. And you, if you've been through this, know it. The hope that you have does not erase the grief in your heart. The hope doesn't all of a sudden make all things right. Our hope is a hope right now. It's not realized. It is recognizing our Savior has won the day. There will be a restoration and a redemption, and death will be no more then. But it's not today. So we grieve knowing that we will see them in the resurrection. We grieve knowing there is coming a time where this will be no more. But we still grieve and still weep and mourn. And so when we have people in our church who are grieving, meet them where they are. Some will want you to answer questions that only God knows the answer to. And it's not your job to at that moment. It's your job to say, I don't know why this happened. I, I don't know why God allows us to go through saying sometimes. I know that he is the one who gives, and I know he's the one that takes away, and I know that we still bless his name because he is good, even when we don't understand the plans. And when they do ask questions like, but what about the resurrection? What hope do we have? We can point them and say, Jesus Christ came and died and rose again so that we may have hope. And when they come to you and they are crying, just cry. Be a shoulder for them to cry on. Allow them to come to you and to grieve. This is the example that Jesus set for us. He grieved with them. Uh, and just to show you, this isn't just sentimental. Uh, Matthew 5, Jesus said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And we know that this is ultimately about those who mourn the state of the world that we are in. It's not just about the loss of a loved one. But here's also the reality. The ultimate consequence of all of our sin has been death. It is the final strike that death deals, or that sin deals. It's the death of those who are made in God's image. So it is appropriate to apply this verse also to recognizing the reason why we are mourning right now. And we grieve is because God did not create this world to be a place where death separates. He made it to be a place where we live and we live with him and we live for an eternity, enjoying the goodness that is our God and walking with him. And in those moments when we have these meetings in grief, we mourn. We mourn the brokenness of this world. And it's something that both grieves our hearts and should stir up our passions to try to go out and to accomplish and to heal and to mend and to try to bring more people into this hope that we have of a resurrection. To bring more people into the, the army of God that is going out and helping to be instruments of healing and life giving in their communities. Like, the, the grief that strikes us is a motivating grief. And you can see this in Jesus. It says, when he saw her crying and the Jews who were crying, he was deeply moved. That is a, that word that is translated deeply moved, it's angered. Like, Jesus was angered at what was happening. Like, I used to read that. I remember reading, there's a couple of translations that do put it in as anger. They don't do the deeply moved. And I would read it and say, was he angry that they were grieving? I'm like, it also says he was deeply troubled. Like the same troubled that when he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he sweat drops of blood. The same trouble that it tells us about when he, re when he uh, is recognizing Judas will be the one to betray him. He's angered. He's troubled. He's not emotionless. He's sympathizing and he's angry. And those loving instincts of protection, those loving instincts that want to bring life and not death, see in front of him the effect of what is broken in the world coming to its conclusion and taking away a loved one from those he cares about. 
He is overcome with these emotions of hatred for the brokenness that he sees in this world. Like It's appropriate for us to feel these things. Christ himself did. We should not be able to go to a funeral and sit there and have no response to it. We should not drive by graveyards and not think anything about it. Ecclesiastes says it is better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting, since that is the end of all mankind, and the living should take it to heart. Grief is better than laughter, for when a face is sad, a heart may be glad. How does that make sense? My face is sad, somehow my heart is glad. Ah, I'm sure you never feel like sometimes Scripture is confusing. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in a house of pleasure. And this is why going out and pursuing pleasure, youth, life, doing everything we can to look as young as we possibly can, denying that one day we all wind up into the grave. All of that forces us to think that this life is nothing about anything other than the pursuit of pleasure. And how many times have people devoted their lives to pleasure only to find their hearts were totally saddened in the process? Their faces were glad and their hearts sad. And what he's saying is there's an appropriate way that we need to take to heart the lesson that we all die one day because of the brokenness of this world. And what we are ultimately find our gladness in is being instruments who go out into a broken world to try to bring real life. Life beyond the grave. Life that doesn't just give us a temporary hope. A a person whose countenance can be both sad and weeping with those people. Grieving, but not without hope. To be people who can walk into the the final place, to the very shadow of death. And can say, my God is here. And has prepared a table for me. And when I close my eyes, I will open them and I will see him face to face. For he has purchased for me a life that is not one that ends in death, but one that even those who believe in him, even though they die, they will live again. That I don't just have the hope of this one life and it being my best life. But this is the life where I get to be someone who labors to bring into this reality parts of that world that is coming. That I get to fight to be someone who flees from sin, which is the the sickness of this dying world. To be filled with the fruits of the Spirit that is the evidence of the world to come so that people may know and run towards that world and find life beyond the grave. It's a lesson that we need to take to heart. It's a lesson that when we're grieving is not even lost on our gods. Even as Jesus was angered and was troubled because of what you and I go through when we do face that and we see that face of death. When we grieve, I found this treasure of a verse in Psalm 56, where the writer says, You yourself have recorded my wanderings. You have put my tears in your bottle, and are they not in your book? What Jesus modeled here is exactly what our God does with us. When you and I suffer in this broken world, he does not look at us unconnected and unsympathetic and just, well, I know all the right answers. He does what Jesus does. Jesus wept. When you are grieving the one that you have lost, Jesus is. When you are angered by the results of our sin, breaking this world to the point to where we suffer in this way, Jesus is. When you are troubled by the the reality that you see, Jesus is. When your tears stream down your face, they are collected into the bottle of our God. When you are wondering and feel lost and confused, He has recorded those wanderings and charted their paths. 
He has not lost it. He has not forgotten you. He has not abandoned you in that moment. He is with you in that moment. With you in a way of the, the perfect comforter who comes to you. Who meets you where you are. And if you seek answers which he is willing to give, will guide you. And if you are grieving, will hold you. This is our God who comes into the very face of death, the the light and life of the world. And when he stands there, he is angered and he is in turmoil and he is troubled. Why? Because he did not make us for this. And he will not leave us in this. And it's why, ending in this, grief, it's a path best traveled together. Jesus does this. He he sees the Jews who are coming with her, this community coming together to mourn what is the final consequence of our sin. He sees them, he sympathizes, he empathizes, he weeps with them. And they even point it out and say, see how he loved him. When this, as we've been following this kind of Uh, war, in a sense, that John is painting a picture of, of light and darkness, the kingdom of darkness versus the kingdom of light. When these two come face to face in this moment where no one is lost on the conflict that's happening, where even the brightest souls seem to be stuffed out by that eternal darkness, Jesus steps into it and he genuinely weeps with us and mourns with us. And walks with us. And oh yeah, you remember that kind of cliche platitude? This is so that they may be glorified, that God may be glorified, and His Son may be glorified. We're going to talk about this more in two weeks. But it's not just a like platitude that means nothing. Because what John talks clearly about is that the glorification of Jesus happens at the cross of Calvary. The glorification of Jesus is the son of life himself submitting himself to death so that his believers may never experience it for an eternal consequence again. The glorification of the son of life was that he himself would be snuffed out. When he says that this this death is ultimately not going to end in Death for Lazarus. He's referring to the resurrection of Lazarus in this temporary moment. Lazarus would die again. But when he says, but it's for the glorification of the Son, he is saying, I will submit myself to the same consequence. Because as we're going to see next week, it is because he raises Lazarus from the dead that the Jewish people ultimately, the Jewish leaders ultimately commit to killing him. It is from this point on in the clearest example that he is the Messiah and the Son of God, that a broken world commits to kill him. And he's willing to submit to it if it means the liberation and freedom of his believers and followers for an eternal life that they could never experience otherwise. He comes and meets us in our grief. He shares our grief He is angered, he is troubled, and he will be glorified, not just to the tomb, but when they come on that fourth, that third day, to roll the tomb away and scream his name, it is already empty. As a church, we are going to face a lot of death. It's one of the functions of a church coming together as a community that we lose those that we care about, that people we care about lose loved ones. And how we walk through it, we need to take these lessons to heart because that is a moment where they are seeing clearly the face of death in a way that is often hidden and we can put out of our mind. And in that darkest moment, we need to be committed to being the brightest light of Christ that we can be to those people. I want to give a shout out to our benevolence team. Like Jenny leads our benevolence team, which is often kind of like the, the first responders to people who lose loved ones in our church. Uh, they go, they take meals, 
They sit with them. They cry with them. They talk with them. Write cards. Uh, if you're interested in helping with that, uh, that is one of an incredibly important ministry that we do as a church. We also have our meal train. Uh, Miss Ricky leads that, which is often we do follow up. We go to people in different situations to help them in those moments. It's the same thing. We have opportunities as a church to enter in some of the darkest moments of people's lives so that we can bring the brightest light as well. Not to come in giving answers that God has not given us. To answer questions that people may have that we are given the answers to. And also to be there to cry with those who are weeping. And to mourn, this world was not meant to be like this. And so we fight that we may help bring that coming world where death is no more and sickness is no more and weeping and wailing and mourning is no more. It's why we're trying to go and become a church that plants other churches so it doesn't just happen here so that we can start to have impacts in our community as a whole to drive back. I mean, you turn on the news, and I know that we talk a lot about how many shootings and things like that that happens in our cities. Do you realize we, as followers of Christ, carry a crucial component to mending that? Like, it's not just law enforcement. Law enforcement can bring punishment. We can bring the gospel of heart change. Do we take that seriously? Is that a motivator to where we're not content to just comfort those who are uh, facing death, but also willing to go into places where death is rampant and to bring the gospel so that there may be freedom and healing? This passage, we're not going to get to the resurrection today, and that's partially intentional. And it's for this reason. We get the hope part, you know, the suppress the death, suppress the negative, the mourning, the grieving. We take our meal, we leave, we do everything we can to forget and not think about it. But we also have really got to take serious the grief. It's part of what it means to long for that world to come is recognizing it's not here yet. Jesus said that those who are mourned or who mourn, will be comforted. And when we do comfort and go into those situations, when we meet people in grief, it is a moment where God's providing us the ability to do exactly what the Son of God has done for us, which is to enter into our world, to grieve with us, and then to remember that eternal hope that is promised for those who believe in Him. So I want to invite us just to spend some time uh, as we have the two, uh, the worship team come up and the final songs, uh, the, the end of the service is just a time for you to reflect. We have worship songs. If you want to sit and pray where you are, if you want to sing, if you want to come talk to me, come to the altar, if you, whatever, however you want to respond, these last minutes are not minutes for us to just forget and move past what we've been talking about. It's for us to chew and to digest and to provide us a little bit of opportunity to really reflect on what we've been talking about from this passage. I can tell you, if you think this is something future, something that we don't have to think about right now, there are numerous people in this room who are grieving right now. This is a lesson that we as a church need to learn from our Savior and it's important for us to learn so that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus to one another. And so let's just spend some time reflecting on it. Stand as we sing.